So in this video, I want to walk you through how I used a VT-132, VT-100 terminal emulator it built into my uh, Altair 8800 semi-clone. Let's talk a little bit about the semi-clone first. The photograph here is of my semi-clone system. Uh, it's not a true Altair 8800. Uh, it's what I ended up building. Uh, there's a bunch of videos on this. So there are reproduction four slot Altair backplanes here. There's three of them. They're stitched together with wire jumpers, as you can see here. Uh, I'm using a, a reproduction front panel, uh, which you can see over here on the side. And rather than that wiring loom that hooked up to the back plane on the original Altair, this actually uses an interface card that you can see here and a 40-pin ribbon cable. I bought these two boards blank and stuffed them myself, and that's the reason it's got a CD-ROM. You know, a cable here labeled CD-ROM, with I needed a 40-pin cable to go between the two points. Um... The front red card here is a Wamco 8080 CPU card from actually back in the day. It is a vintage card. Uh, the data lines on it jump are over to here. Uh, on the Altair, original Altair, there was a, a jumper that came off the CPU card to the front panel that, that sent data across to the front panel, essentially, and that's done here. Uh, the Wamco card has a little dip header down here that gets wired across. This is, uh, with the three heat sinks here, this card is a uh, 16K RAM card, it, another vintage card. Uh, and finally, the card in the back here, uh, we're going to look at it a little bit closer in a second, is a Solid State Music IO4. Let's move on to the next photo with that Solid State Music IO4. Again, this is a vintage card. Uh, my clone here is a mix of vintage and newer reproduction stuff. Uh, what you're seeing here, these card guides are 3D printed, so somebody has created an STL file of the original Altair card guides. They are screwed in the bottom of the back plane. You know, seg section here, j just as it was on the original machine, there's the, you know, those jumper cables, uh, the plus eight, and the ground here that are heavier gauge wire, and then all the data, address signals, and everything. But plugged into here is this IO4 solid state music card from 1977. It's got two serial ports on it, so it's got serial A and serial B. There's a couple of UART chips here. They are AY5 1013s, I believe. And then there's two parallel I.O. ports, so out B, in B, out A, and in B. And this is using the 74 uh, S412s, uh, uh, and Intel 8212 is the same thing. It's an 8-bit I.O. port. And this one, of course, provides out. It's a latch. This one provides in, out for A, and in for A. This card, in the end, is, is providing the two serial ports for the machine. Uh, this one is the main console. You, you know, if you've got a terminal hooked up, what you're plugged into. And this is just the second serial port that's on the card. If you're running CPM, the main console is, of course, on this one here. There's some jumper configurations here for the serial ports and various dip switch settings. But this is just, like I say, it's, an, it's a, you know, a vintage uh, Serial and parallel I.O. card, and I've just noticed the heat sink here is crooked. I wonder how I did that. Uh, this card, as I recall, yeah, this card has EIA converters here, so this is actually true RS-232, uh, swinging from the plus 12 to minus 12, or whatever range it is. There's actually drivers here to make that happen. Uh, another view of that same card. Uh, this captures a little bit about in this uh, port here, this parallel port, I've got a dip header plugged in. And I'm just picking up plus 5 and ground from here. You can't see the ground. And that's the power of the VT-132 that's installed inside of the machine. Uh, just so you're aware of what the back of the machine looks like, uh, there's a PS2 connector. I, you know, I drilled a hole here and mounted the PS2 connector in that spot. There was already a hole here for something. I don't remember what. I just enlarged the hole and drilled the holes. But that's where the PS2 keyboard will plug in. There's a VGA output here. So these two connections come from the VT-132 card. Uh, that's the VT-100 emulator uh, from the high nibble. Uh, we'll look at how this card's installed inside. So a PS2 keyboard connector, VGA out. Uh, down here on the bottom, let's hit these two first, is that Solid State Music Serial A. So there's your main console for the machine and Solid State Music Serial B. Uh, this could be a serial printer, you know, a modem, whatever you wanted to use it for. These are the two connectors that come off of that solid state music card. We just looked at the blue card. And then the VT-132 has two serial ports on it. It has a serial port for talking to a terminal, or not a terminal, to, for talking to some serial device out in the world. Uh, and that 
you know, it takes that serial port and creates the VGA and, you know, the, I can't talk here. The VGA and PS2 talk directly to this serial port. You know, if you type a character, it gets spewed out of serial data here. If serial data comes in, it gets, you know, whatever uh, character ROM, etc. is going to happen, written into the VGA memory space and output with the terminal here. We've got a connector up here for the floppy disk controller plus. That is what I use for my floppy disk controller in the machine. And we've got the VT132 serial B here. This is, in reality, the Wi-Fi modem that's built into the VT132. So just keep in mind kind of what these six, you know, the six used positions here are, are really seven, as we're looking inside of the machine. So this is a look down into those same connectors. We can see the VT132 sitting here. This is the one designed for the RC2014 bus. Because the size was really convenient, I just went ahead and used it as my internal uh, you know, t terminal emulator. Uh, you can't see it here, but what I've done is taken a slot filler from a PC card. It was a VGA card that was dead, and I've trimmed that slot filler down. I've mounted this VGA connector into that, you know, that metal bracket, and I've drilled a couple of holes, and it's just screwed in here. You know, you can see it right here. It's just screwed in here in the, you know, on this DB25 spot. So there's no modification to the machine for this. It's just, you know, it's just exposed through, uh, you know, a DB25 here. There are two of these converter boards here. There's one hidden here and one hidden here. These are boards I designed ages ago. Uh, this is a RS-232 level on this side and TTL level. So it's a TTL level converter for EIA level RS-232. It uses a MAX-232. Uh, and it just does that translation from 5 volts. And this was designed to actually be attached to a DB25 to fill slots like we have here. Uh, I couldn't find anything like this on Tindy or any place. Everything was DB9, so I just designed my own. There's two of them installed here. This is what's producing the EIA level serial I.O. for the VT100 uh, emulator here. You can see where power is being picked up here. So power and ground are being picked up in here and coming to this pin header and coming to the pin header in here for the second converter. And then I'm picking up transmit and receive B, transmit and receive A up here. And those wires come around to the uh, orange and yellow here and the orange and yellow here. So that's how I'm interfaced to the machine. Is on the, the RC2014 bus down here, I'm just picking up power from the power pins directly. And I'm also picking up transmit A and B, and receive A and B again from the RC2014 connector right down here. Uh, the VT132 is then jumpered here to... Uh, what was needed to get you know the pin on these correctly and then finally there is a uh, power cable you can see it here out of focus and if we step back to here you can see that power cable comes in to this dip header and it's picking up plus five and ground off that header to power the vt132 and then and then to power these two boards that plus five comes to the board and then comes off the board to these two boards down here on the back of the machine, you saw the, v, the VGA output, you saw the FDC plus serial interface, you saw the VT132 uh, serial out and, and the wireless modem out. Uh, I am saying VT100 and VT132 here interchangeably. You know, this is a VT132 designed for the RC2014 bus that emulates a VT100 plus a whole bunch of, I'll call them extensions, VT220 features, etc. So let's move on to another kind of picture here. Same thing I just described. You can see a little more of what's mounted here, and you can begin to see down here they're out of focus. These are the two RS-232 connectors that eventually come up to the SSM memory card over here. So they just loop around behind. We'll actually go look at where those come to. One of them comes to here, and one of them comes to here. So serial A and serial B, and these just run off through you know, a little wire set that's soldered on down here, ground, transmit, and receive. Uh, you know, it's pin 2, 3, and 7 on those connectors. So, uh, another kind of view with the same thing. It's kind of a wiring mess. Uh, you can see here clearly where the PS2 connector just has jumper links that come down. The connector where the original PS2 connector would have been on the board, uh, where power comes into the board, where power comes out of the board to power the converters, where serial in and out from the board happen to come down again to the converters. So, you know, it's a pretty straightforward conversion. 
Uh, you can see here a little clearer the metal bracket that come off of that VGA card. You know, it was the slot filler that I just trimmed down to fit inside, mounted the VGA connector directly on it. The card just hangs off this VGA connector. That is the support for the card. The strain leaves here are soldered to the card, so it's a nice solid install. And then just a, a, a couple of screws and bolts here to hold it in place. Uh, so again, pretty easy to mount. Uh, you may be noticing other things here in this machine. I'll just point them out. I, you know, I call this full machine my Altair 8800 semi-clone. And that's because that's not exactly a clone of, of the original Altair. The transformer happens to be sitting down here underneath here. And the filter cap over here. So that breaks with right there with the layout of the original uh, Altair 8800. That's just how I mounted it. It was easier to build the machine this way. Uh, there's another look inside at the S132. There's that second a level translator we haven't got a good picture of yet, and the first one we've been looking at over here. Uh, the two open slots you saw, and then the console output, and the second serial port output. Uh, and of course, it's it's chassis ground, chassis, I think it's chassis ground, transmit and receive, I don't remember which one is which, and signal ground, if I remember correctly, on these. Uh, and in this case, the chassis ground and the signal ground are tied together. Another view of the same thing. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the VT-132, this is a VT-100 emulator sold by the High Nibble. If you search for High Nibble VT-132, you'll find his website. It uses an ESP32 uh, or Rover, W Rover, CPU, uh, and it emulates a VT-100 really, really well. Uh, it's got the beeper on it. Control G creates a beep. There is a reset for the card here and a, a, a switch here to get it into programming mode. He releases firmware updates fairly often. You could actually do an over the air wireless update on this. So this card acts, or the, you know, this, this device can be connected to your Wi Fi network uh, at home. And then through the, uh, the software in here that emulates a, a modem, it becomes a Wi-Fi modem. You can actually, over the wireless, use your Altair to go out and surf BBSs, that kind of stuff. It's actually very cool. Uh, look at the specs for the VT, his VT100 uh, emulator if, if you're really curious. It, it, it does a bunch of stuff beyond what the VT100 could do. And it does things like the, the original VT100 setup menus are there. You know, it's identical if you ever used a VT100 to what it felt like back in the day. And like I said, and then again, it adds a bunch of extensions like color and other stuff. Uh, really pretty slick. It's got a built-in VGA character set. So when you're out surfing like a BBS that used ANSI graphics, you can put the card in the correct mode and have the right character set and see the ANSI graphics. You know, very, very cool stuff. Anyhow, that's way off topic here. This is just a reminder again of what the back of the machine looked like. This will be a little more important as we get into the next two photos. PS2 for keyboard, VGA out. The VT132 serial uh, I.O. ports. These have the level translators behind them that take the you know EIA level RS232 and convert it to the 5 volt that the VT100 needs. And then the, the console output and the second serial output from the solid state music card are sitting down here. So how I use the machine in real life. Uh, I've just removed the labels here so you get a, a, a little bit better look so that this next photo will make more sense. So if I want to use the VT100 as my serial port, I plug in a PS2 keyboard, you can't see it here, I plug in a VGA monitor, and I take the console output from the Solid State Music Card, and I use this jumper cable I wired to connect it up to the console input, or you know, the console port on the VT132. And now I am using, you know, a PS2 keyboard and the VG output as a terminal. So just by putting this jumper in here, I enable that, that functionality. I can remove this jumper and I can take the console output here to any terminal I want to connect to. I haven't lost that ability. You know, I can totally ignore the VT132 if I want to. Uh, and I've, you know, it's just got this little jumper cable that, that enables that feature for me. I've got the same thing here for the second serial ports, the solid state music, second serial port, and the wireless modem port uh, on the VT132. They can be jumpered together. I could take this off to a, a, an external terminal and, and control the machine from that external terminal and use all the features of the Wi-Fi modem for like surfing, uh, BBSs, that kind of stuff if you wanted to. Uh, if I want to use both of them, 
uh, directly off the S132 card. I just put both of them on. So, you know, you know, there's no other configuration on the machine at this point besides which combination of cables I use. And this is kind of a scenario we discussed before where I've got the Wi-Fi modem hooked up to the second port on the Solid State Music. I'm taking the, the console uh, port A off the Solid State Music card and it's just coming out on a cable and it's going to an RS-232 uh, to USB adapter here that goes off to this laptop over here actually in this case. So I'm using, in this case, either PuTTY or TerraTerm on this laptop to act as the console for the machine. Uh, so as you can see, it's very versatile. And, and just so it's said again, this real connector is for the floppy disk controller plus. So it's kind of out of play with these. Normally there'd be a cable plugged into it. Uh, the floppy disk controller plus, just so it's said here, uh, DRAMP, D-E-R-M-P, F-D-C plus. I don't remember the, the, the full name, but it's an a, a eight inch or five and a quarter inch or emulated floppy controller for the, the Altair. Uh, the serial cable actually runs off can run off to a Windows PC and there's a server app that runs on the Windows PC and you can mount floppies directly in that app on Windows and they appear as floppies in the machine here. And that card is what I use to attach images of CPM22 configured for the, the Altair machine on the PC and then I use the ribbon cable coming off that card to go to actual 8 inch floppy drives and I use it to image bootable floppies and then I can just remove the cable here and boot from actual floppies. This has all been demonstrated in other videos up here on the channel. Is there anything else to say here? I don't know. We always go back and recap kind of this stuff. Let's move back to the beginning and just see if I've missed anything. I guess I, now that we've walked through it, I can kind of point out some additional stuff about my semi-clone here. The transformer is mounted back here. Normally it would be mounted up here. We've got the main filter capacitor here for the plus eight. We have a reproduction Altair power board sitting down here that's got the two capacitors in it for the plus 16 and minus 16. Uh, there's a bridge rectifier mounted to the case down here. There's a large ground connector down here to the case, and I've star grounded the entire machine, so all the grounds come together in, in a common spot here, which, which gives me a pretty clean power in the machine. There's a high wattage power resistor here because this transformer I used up puts a little more voltage than I'd like on the plus eight. I drop, I think about half a volt across this resistor to the bus. And what that does, and I talk about this in the video again, is it reduces the amount of heat the voltage regulators dissipate because part of that drop is happening in this resistor into the back of the case. Cooling fan, same as the uh, Altair had. I talked about the front panel a little bit. I didn't take a picture of the front of the machine, but it looks like an Altair. Uh, you know, and it, it works like an Altair. The only real difference are the power switches, or the switches. Uh, the, the switches look different just because you can't give the, you can't get the bat handle switches anymore that look the same. Uh, anything else to mention here? You can ignore the mess on the bench behind. That's other projects going on. Uh, I guess the other thing I can mention, I don't have a demo of this here, is this entire card cage can be lifted up out and set outside of the machine. It's not permanently mounted. And the power cables run through the, this cable guide stuff. And the power cables just follow. Um, the ribbon cable and the long power cable allow you to pull that entire backplane out and set it outside of the machine. You can look at the bottom, you can scope signals, whatever you need to do. And it makes a really neat demonstration. Uh, where people can actually see it from all sides and see the bottom and you know that kind of stuff we talked about the card this is an original you know vintage card uh the connections the kind of wiring mess inside and yeah it, it, it probably could be cabled better but it is what it is uh and just kind of all the photos we sorted through I can make the KiCad files available if somebody wants to manufacture, you, you know, build some of these. Uh, you know, it's got the same pinout here in this case as a FTDI cable, so you could plug a FTDI cable into here off to a, a USB adapter on a PC and talk to the card that way if you wanted to bypass back here. There's lots of options here, uh, you, you know, generic serial in, etc. You know, it uses a Max 232. They've gotten hard to find. I'm actually using one microfarad caps here. 
Uh, some people use disc caps. This is just, you know, it, it is the parts I had on hand when I designed it. Uh, VT-132 card. There's also a VT standalone. So the VT-132 standalone that's a different form factor. That's a square card and it's got you know room on it for 9 pin and 25 pin serial connectors and it's got pin headers for VGA and that kind of stuff. So it's a little more versatile for like mounting into a case or a chassis or something. Uh, this was the card I had on hand when I built this and it actually fit really nice in this spot. Uh, I've got a different S100 machine that uses one of the standalones and it is mounted on a prototype S100 card. Uh, that machine's an open chassis, open chassis machine. It's never closed up. Uh, and so it's easy to get connections into there and I do kind of a similar thing to what I do on the back here. Uh, nice card. This is one of the prototype cards, I believe, one of the early builds. Uh, I believe that this card is. I could be wrong. So if you buy one of these cards, the layout might be slightly different from this. Uh, though I don't think so. Uh, it, it'd be pretty close. Uh, another look inside. It really bothers me that power connection is not plugged down tight there. And I think that really finishes this one up. Uh, you know, this has been a very versatile way of doing this for me. I've been very pleased with it. The fact that I can unhook down here and plug any serial device in I want here. You know, I've got an ADM3 terminal floating around here. Uh, I think that's the only actual physical terminal I have at the moment. I think it's an ADM3 that could be used on here. What else to say here? Uh, you, you know, I think this covers it. Uh, if you got this far in the video, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, if you think it's worth a like, like if you're not subscribed and think the channel for subscribing to subscribe I don't monetize uh, so you know you're not going to get a lot of commercials you know ads and that kind of stuff I'm not a monetized channel I'm just in this as a hobby uh, and for having fun and, and you know and for the community so anyhow I will put links to the high nibble and to the FDC plus down in the, the video notes so if you're actually interested in looking at those you can click through uh, from there. I guess that really wraps it up. I guess we'll talk soon.